Since the very beginning of time, we've been trying to recreate what nature put in front of our eyes. Nature seems to hold some kind of secret that makes it both beautiful and resilient. And we've been obsessed with trying to replicate that ability. After thousands of years, we've been pretty successful in creating our own version of the world. But this is the first time in history that we've actually had the technology to really extract the secrets of nature and replicate some of its very elegant designs. I'm sure you've noticed more and more buildings popping up that are inspired by nature. But similar to what we're seeing with AI right now, just because we can doesn't mean we should. So copying nature, is it fundamentally flawed? Does nature really have the answer to a better future? Does it even make sense to scale these designs? A portion of this video is sponsored by AG1. I'm not a religious person, but I had something very close to a spiritual experience when I first visited Sagrada Familia. Suddenly, I was floating in this strange forest built out of bones or sand, crafted with such detail, and a ceiling that reminded me of the sky, the forest, the sun, and the universe all at the same time. Uh, are you okay? Huh? Gaudi was obsessed with nature, and for him, it was the ultimate source of inspiration. He would study ants, trees, snakes, skeletons, and when he was commissioned as big project, Sagrada Familia, the place of God, he tried to extract those lessons and recreate them in his building. So if you go in his building, most people will probably say that it feels organic, but there's actually a logical reason for this feeling. He realized nature had a series of geometric rules. The hyperbolic paraboloid, the conoid, a double turn helicoidal shape, creating a structure now known as a fractal. But he's probably best known for his extensive use of catenary arches, which is formed when a chain of uniform density is hung from two points, creating a shape that's in complete tension. When you inverse this, you get a shape that's in complete compression. You could probably call his designs an early form of biomimicry, which is defined as the design and production of materials, structures, and systems that are modeled on biological entities and processes. But when Gaudi started the project in 1882, they didn't really have parametric software. And in fact, they didn't even have computers. So he constructed models using weighted chains. Then he would either place a mirror or take photographs and flip it upside down to understand the structure of the building. The problem is that this project is uh, never finished. It's been going on for more than a hundred years and it's supposed to finally finish in 2026. And I think that's the problem with buildings inspired by nature. Even though they can be incredibly beautiful, compared to a standard boxy building, they can be extremely hard to build and it can consume a lot of resources. All right, let's look at another example. This is a Venus flower basket sea sponge. It looks very delicate, but it's got a very strong lattice structure that provides stiffness while being able to bend at the intersections, meaning it can flex without damaging the core arrangement. The rounded shape disperses the forces from the strong currents, and this mesh forms a hollow basket that allows water and nutrition to filter through. You've probably seen this building before. It's the iconic building in the London skyline known as the Gherkin, which is probably a more catchy name than the Venus flower basket sea sponge. But this building mimics the shape and structure of the sponge and basically does the same thing, but in air. The rounded shape allows the air to flow smoothly around the building, which creates pressure differences that power the natural ventilation system. 
So it's not only mimicking the form, but it's also mimicking the function and performance of the organism. The system guides fresh air into atriums at every six stories, which is distributed to each floor through its double facade. This double skin facade also provides extra insulation in the winters, and this entire system reduces the power consumption of the building by 50%. Or that's what it was supposed to be. In 2005, one of the operable windows broke off the facade, and they decided to limit the use of this passive ventilation system, and now it just operates on a very standard mechanical ventilation system, just like any other building. Actually, when we were doing research for this video, we could only find a handful of truly successful examples that really seem to emulate the design and principles of nature. Even the water cube building in Beijing, inspired by soap bubbles, which received lead gold has a 30% reduction in energy consumption compared to similar buildings. To build this, it used 90 kilometers of steel. It's 100,000 square meters of plastic. It's not really the most sustainable material. This really makes me wonder, is it practical to scale nature's designs? I've been following these guys since I was in architecture school. Every year, the research group at ITKE built these biomimetic. Every year, the research group at biomimetic. Uh, sorry to start over. Yeah, the research group at ITKE built these biomimetic pivot. These biomim. Oh. Sometimes you're feeling so tired that you can't even say basic words. AG1 is my go-to when I'm feeling a little bit groggy, a little bit tired, and it really helps me with my stress and focus. I started taking AG1 during the pandemic, basically when I realized I needed to start taking a little bit more accountability for my health. And it was long before I was getting paid to talk about it. It's a foundational nutritional supplement, so it also supports immune health, gut health, with 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients. I do try to eat nutrient-dense meals, but it's not always realistic. AG1 is easy to drink, it tastes good, so it's really easy to incorporate into your routine. And I always take it when I'm traveling, just so that I know I've covered all my bases when it comes to my nutrition. Go to drinkag1.com slash Lee to get started on your very first order. AG1 is gonna give my community a free one-year supply of AG vitamin D3 and K2 and five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring this video. Okay, as I was saying, the research group at ITKE build these biomimetic pavilions every year, not using standard materials like concrete and steel, but new high-performing materials. This was their first pavilion in 2010, where they explore the structural capacities and the elastic bending behavior of birch plywood strips. They input the material properties into a digital model, and once they come up with an ideal form, they used a six-axis robot to manufacture the pieces, which they assembled manually on site. Similarly, in 2011, they used a digital model to simulate the material behavior and form. They used a robotic arm to manufacture the pieces, which then they manually assembled on site. In 2012, See what a big leap that is from this to this? This design was based off their analysis of a lobster's exoskeleton. And this year, the pavilion was entirely robotically fabricated. This is from the team. A key aspect of the project was to transfer the fibrous morphology of the biological role model to fiber reinforced composite material, the anisotropy of which was integrated from the start into the computer-based design and simulation processes, thus leading to new tectonic possibilities in architecture. So what they're trying to say is they couldn't just replicate the structural arrangement at an abstract level using any material because this type of structure would only work with the unique material properties of the biological role model, in this case, the chitin fibers found in the lobsters. So they had to find a material with similar properties, in this case, carbon and glass fiber composites. And because this material had never been used this way before, they had to think of a new way of using it. 
by, again, inputting the material properties into a digital model and simulating a structure that would optimize the capabilities of this material. All of this led to a really cool ass looking form, as well as an extremely high performing structure, only four millimeters of composite laminate while spanning eight meters. In 2013 was the first time they used microcomputer tomography in their process, which gave them the ability to analyze, this time, a beetle shell at a very intricate level. From this, they discovered that the shell is a double layer structure connected by curved support elements, kind of like a column. The fiber layout within this column, which is called the trabecula, merges the upper and lower shell segments. Based on this, they also developed a double-layered modular system, again, using carbon and glass fiber composites. And basically, they weaved it together using another new method, two mirroring KUKA robots, a slave robot and a master robot. So what I'm trying to show you here is with every new technology that's introduced into the system, they're able to more closely mimic nature's designs, and they're able to better optimize the characteristics of each material, leading to stronger and more resource efficient structures that don't really look like anything else that's been built before. Just last year, they introduced a new challenge into the mix, a sustainable building material, flax fibers. They're renewable and biodegradable, and they're comparable in their structural properties as the glass and carbon fiber, but they have a much lower embodied energy. Taking this idea one step further, this is a five meter tall structure by Neri Oxman Studio, made entirely of cells of living organisms, AKA biopolymers. It's made of 80% water, 20% trees, apple skins, and shrimp cells, which are some of the most common biopolymers on our planet. Here, they 3D print the material into a layered structure that combines elements that are like shells and also like skins creating a kind of biocomposite. The idea is that over its lifespan, the structure reacts to the environment, changing in shape or color or rigidity, depending on the temperature or humidity or sunlight. I don't know how it could scale at the size of a building per se, but biopolymers do have really great insulation properties and they can regulate moisture as well. And the point here, is that these biocompositions can be specifically combined and tuned to the kind of behavior that you're looking for. Imagine we could build buildings or towers or even cities as living organisms that adapt and respond to their environment. And at the end of the building's life cycle, it just decomposes into the earth. But what if we didn't design at all? And instead of mimicking nature, we just let nature design. In the Silk Pavilion project by Neri Oxman and her team, they co-created a six meter tall fiber structure with silkworms. They found that the silkworms distribute themselves based on the environmental conditions like gravity, heat, and light. So in order to control the density of the silkworms, in turn, the density of the fabric, they designed a robotic loom, which would rotate in order to control these environmental conditions. The primary structure was a kind of scaffolding made of soluble knit, which provided a template that the silkworms could follow. So going beyond just sustainability or optimizing the material properties, this new way of co-creating with other species and designing the process, not just the final form, it gives each structure its own kind of expression, a kind of a soul. I find it kind of comforting that in nature, there's logic and reason behind every single shape, every single curvature, every single hair, 
There's a seamless connection between function and form, which lead to designs that make the most optimal use of resources. And that's probably because nature has been developing and iterating through these designs for like 3.8 billion years, dumping the bad ones and letting the smart ones continue on. The smartest part of nature is that it's a closed loop system where the death of one organism means the nutrients for another where different species can coexist and thrive in a symbiotic relationship. Sometimes totally weird relationships. <laughs> Remember the Venus flower basket sea sponge? This creature has a very interesting relationship with a particular type of deep sea shrimp. When a young shrimp meets his partner, they take shelter in the sponge, which protects it from predators. The skeletal framework, as we talked about before, it allows the nutrients to filter through, and this feeds the shrimp. In return, the shrimp clean the inside of the sponge. But once this shrimp couple grows older, they become too big to fit through the mesh, and they're trapped in there until they die. Their offspring, however, are small enough to fit through, so they can leave to find their own partners and also their own flower basket. That's nature. It's a beautiful and smart system, but it's a system of give and take. We've just been taking and taking and taking for so long, using the earth as our playground that I think we've completely forgotten that we're a part of this system. And one day, in a not so distant future, we're also gonna have to give back. Thanks for watching guys. If you guys are interested in all the research that didn't make it into this video, you can find our research booklet down in the description. Also, I have a Discord server and a newsletter. I'll leave those in the description as well. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.